Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 43 of the Alexis Cell podcast. And uh, whew, what a fresh. What a fresh. I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a. <laughs> what, have we, what, have, Ooh, what have we here? Oh, oh. What a podcast we've got for you! It's a, <laughs> it's um, a double episode. Uh, well, one episode following another, whatever the technical term for that is, and its uh, official title is a very Capaldi Christmas because it's our um, long interview with uh, Peter Capaldi that we did about his um, his early life and then his, his later career as Doctor Who and. Uh, the thick of it and um, all the other stuff, and uh, I hope it's. Uh, I hope you find it a, a suitable Christmas gift. Mm, to we had you so from much. Us. We had yes, so what? much Capaldi. We had to carve it in half, like yeah. a turkey. Uh, well, we don't carve turkey. Well, whatever. And uh, we yeah, have to so, curry it and have it on sandwiches. Yes, exactly. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, we're releasing the first half of our really long chat with yeah. Capaldi. Yeah, and uh, tell all your friends and all your Doctor Who, uh, you know, diehard fan fan base all around the world, mm-hmm. and uh, also anybody you know, anybody interested in Star Wars, even though it's nothing about Star Wars in it, but you could, we could trick them into listening. Yeah, no, no, he was in Star Wars, wasn't he? He played a no, he wasn't, was Doglomite he? from Planet. Oh, fucking hell, did he? <laughs> No, minute. Alexi, we're trying to get Star Wars fans in. <laughs> he didn't. I said that was you being funny. Yeah, no, yeah. He was Luke was Skywalker's human. uncle's yeah. best friend at the milk mine. Yeah, well, some of that, some of that shit. <laughs> um, so, well, yeah, get, get them listening as well. And, uh, you know, boost our figures, which, Talal, you've got some interesting, exciting information about our We've had a million listeners. It's a Christmas miracle. Yeah. It's a Christmas miracle. It's We've had a the million. Only one. Um, the only one. The only one, man. Yeah, it, it's it's going to be a weird, uh, it's going to be weird trying to celebrate Christmas. This yeah, year, it isn't is, it? yeah. Um, uh, so uh, through the dark shadow that uh, that covers us all this Christmas season, there is a small beacon of light, and that is that this little endeavour, the Let's Sell podcast, has, has finally had over a million listens, individual downloads and listens Yay. to the podcast. And that does not include people who watch the show on YouTube, which is a considerable sure, amount. Yeah, they yeah. listen to the podcast yeah. on YouTube. But through their little podcast devices mobile phones laptops they have had a million listens which is definitely the biggest thing i've ever been a part of yeah i know in the 90s your shows used to fart a million viewers oh yeah it's not Um, the biggest thing i've been part of by any means but still it's you know i'll settle for that it's insane and in terms of podcasting there's there's a million podcasts out there for people to choose so we're obviously very grateful for each one of you uh, that chooses to listen to this man, it's 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 quite surreal, actually. Um, I think, in a way, we've maintained. I mean, it's, um, you know, you learn as you go along. I think we've maintained to a degree the there was obviously initial burst of enthusiasm and stuff like that, but I think we've maintained uh, our, you know, we've kept the energy up, haven't we? Really, we kept the, energy up. the quality yeah, is uh, yeah. always on an on an upward tick, and yeah. um, we we mix it up too. I don't think we've ever rested on. No. Our laurels. Well, well, maybe in terms of formatting and kind of the way the show, the way the dynamic kind of goes. But like in terms of the guests we have on and the topics we discuss, we do kind of spread the gamut, don't we? Yeah. Um, what do you gamut. think? Little quiz time, a Christmas quiz for Alexa. Yeah. Do you want to try and guess? Yeah. Which episodes are in our top yeah. five yeah. listen to episodes? Yeah. I think the thing that our listeners want most is the driest, dullest um, podcasts about internal left-wing politics. So I would say uh, Phil Bevin in, on there. Uh, I can't remember after people now, really. It's, uh, uh, Corbyn R for Road Java with um, Con Ross. Uh, mm-hmm. The Evelyn War one. I, don't, I didn't really like those women. And, 
Um, <laughs> and uh, well, and, one, one at a um, time. What going? Name one because they're so name far. One. Well, I'm, I'm deliberately. I know that oh, you're running a list of right. only the Jeremy Corbyn out of the ones you've all said. Yeah, out of all the ones you've said, only the Jeremy Corbyn one is in the top five. Yeah. So that one's in the top five. Any other guesses? Well, no. I mean, if I'm honest, I think I know that the ones that people, the ones that get the most listeners are actually the ones with other comedians and stuff, aren't they? Hmm. Although, actually, Bassam Yusuf, who's like mega, we didn't, we maybe we should repackage that one because he's, especially at the moment. Especially at the moment, we could repost yeah. that one. But the, um, I imagine, I know that the Stuart Lee one was the most. Uh, Stuart Lee took number one with a bullet. Yeah. yeah. Um, for sure. Jeremy Corbyn is in there. Oh, of the course, f- I forgot we interviewed him. I, yeah, you mentioned that. I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's the number yeah. four. Yeah. Um, and then our first episode. Right. Keir so Starmer Establishment Tool. The very first episode we dropped, that's in there too. That's number two. Right. Um, and then the second episode is also in there. And then surprisingly, sneaking its way into the top five, is uh, the episode we did with David Rennick and Andrew Marshall. Really? Yeah, Comedy Too Many Runnies. That was quite an early one as well, wasn't it, Bob? It was quite early. And yeah. a few of the early ones snuck into the top five. But then after that, it's all kind of later ones. You've got Diane Morgan, very popular. Of course, another comedian, Om- yeah. Omid Jalili, very popular. Right. And then some nice solo ones where it's just you and me. That's finishing stupid, out the top yeah. ten. Oh, Josie Long, very popular one, actually. Right. Young One Special. Oh, I'm, I'm going really past sad. the top yeah. 10 now. But the Young Ones one, we need to do that again. We need to do another Young yeah. Ones. Yeah. We need to get Bloody Nigel in, man. Oh, bloody Nigel. I'll have to see him all the bloody time. So I yeah. Should. I love him so much. Do you? Uh, and the afternoon we spent with him and Lisa watching the Young Ones <clears> in Lisa's house. Patreons get an exclusive look at the first episode of that. I've yet to put together the second one, but there is another episode in the tank. Um, so, you know, join the Patreon. And look, yeah. while I'm on the topic of listeners and that, I uh, we're very, we love that we have so many supporters on the Patreon. Look, let me just read a couple messages from our Patreon community who we love and adore, right, Lex? Yes, we do. When we first created the Patreon about a year ago, maybe a bit more than a year ago, what we promised them nothing, right? That was like the whole <laughs> the whole gimmick of that was kind of like the Stalinist thing where you yeah. like uh there was different tiers. There was like a gold membership, silver membership, <laughs> platinum membership. But nice. the big promise, you wrote a nice little yeah. a nice cover letter for me to post, and it's uh-huh. still up there. Promising our patrons nothing in return for their support and their money. But that's not true anymore. There is exclusive content that only patron listeners get. Patron uh, subscribers. Betrayed the purity of the revolution, but still that always happens. And there will be more to come. You've got me and Alexi shooting guns. My brother edited that video with his hip hop music. And it's really good. If you like guns, it's kind of like... (laughs) The subject matter isn't very complex, but it's literally just us at a shooting range talking yeah. about the guns. I wish we'd been... They, we were so <laughs> intent on not embarrassing the people at uh, the rifle range that... Yeah, and we still had us to... us a bit. Well, it's and also a... we did have a word. You know, people had a word with us. Yeah. Like, you what, better watch what you talk about. So we were kind of yeah. had our hands tied. We couldn't ne- wax lyrical about the uh, political complexity of the whole situation. No. We just got to shoot some guns and say, ooh, e, uh, you burnt your finger a little bit on one of the guns. That's quite exciting. <laughs> um, uh, we got the Young Ones watch-alongs on there, and there'll be more of that to come. And I'll be putting, like, video... So this Capaldi episode, we filmed the whole thing. So I'll put video clips or maybe the whole thing uh, up on the Patreon so that you can look at his face while he talks to us. Okay. Um, let, let me just read a quick couple messages. So Simon mm-hmm. on the Patreon, we love you, Simon. He's been a member since December, 2022. Um, he says, sorry, it's a bit late. I wanted to suggest during the next podcast, it might be a good idea to mention the number of patrons while appealing for additional new ones. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
So we have 298 patrons. Right. Um, what's the diff? What's the because we got fifteen thousand subscribers. What's the difference? Or is that just what's the difference? Those are just people who listen to the podcast for free. And, oh right. And that's absolutely uh, great. We don't. We don't. We're not bitter about anyone who's not a patron member. I'm um, bit. Um, but you know, you get all this lovely stuff from us for free, and we're never gonna put adverts in the show. And if you can afford to like buy us a cup of coffee a month or buy me a beer a month or, you know, yes. and it, it's not too much off your back, then please consider going to patreon.com forward slash Alexis sale podcast please. and help keep the show running, man. Please. Um, my time costs money. Equipment costs money. Microphones. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, when we're, we're going on the road tomorrow to record another episode with someone and um, I'm going to need to pay for congestion charge, parking. Yeah. You know, this stuff, time and stuff costs money to yeah. make a podcast. The subscription fees for Audio Boom, Zencaster, all this shit. So your contribution really, really helps. So we have 298 patrons. All right. Uh, let's get them. that up to 350 in the new let's year. Let's do that. Come on, guys. <laughs> um uh, Simon finishes. Keep up the interesting shows and thank you for the nothing. I really appreciate it. Uh, J. Coprario on Patreon says, Thank you for the excellent shows. Um, would you consider interviewing Craig Murray? Do you know who Craig Murray is? Yes, that's a good idea. I really like Craig Murray. I, I read his his blog for nothing. And um, he's, yeah, he's a really, really interesting guy. I think why well, he always. Really incisive analysis of uh, contemporary. Yes, and on his and uh, that's a very good idea. Recently, very recently, on a return from a work trip to Iceland, he got <clears throat> detained by Scottish police. Well, he was actually. I mean, it's like um, you know, no, for his he was, support he, he, of Assange spent, and Palestine. He spent time in prison, like three months or something, for this thing called jigsaw identification. Uh, which nobody has ever, ever, apart from him, ever been charged with. And it's the, the it's food. partly about how poisonous, I think, politics up there in Scotland is and how, with, uh, from the, certainly from the nationalist standard, I suspect the Labour Party as Okay. Well. well, make a mental note. But Maybe yeah, we reach out to uh, him. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a very good idea. Um, Sean on Patreon, Stylophobia on Patreon, Emily on Patreon, uh, thank you so much for your support and your lovely messages too. Uh, I will stop harping on about it. Um, oh, one more though on our Instagram. You can follow us on Instagram at Alexi Sale Pod. Uh, Amy messaged. Yeah, this is the last thing I want to talk about um, or mention. Is she says um, just traveling from just travelled from London to Reading to see Alexi live. <laughs> Um, yeah. you're not ready for retirement yet that was amazing she absolutely smashed loved it she said you smashed it mm-hmm. so what you hosted a comedy night in reading yeah recently. it was um well it was a weird one really it was the slapstick festival which is a festival in bristol but they can they hold a fundraising comedy benefit every year but because the venues are so expensive in bristol they actually hold it in reading <clears throat> and originally Ahmed <laughs> was um Ahmed was scheduled to MC it um but I think he's had a bit of trouble with, um, he's had to cancel some dates and stuff. And all the posters featuring Ahmed in, the, I think, around the city had their eyes torn out and stuff like that. Now. Yeah. And so they offered it to me. How is he more controversial than you? Well, I, I said to, you know, I, I mentioned this to the audience at the start that his eyes had been torn out. And I said, I was, I was sorry I'd done that. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, I see. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a desperate attempt to get back into the red in hexagons, which I haven't been <laughs> since 1995. Um, I, I don't know, it's weird. I don't know what it is. I mean, I don't want to get him in. I mean, it's, I don't know whether it is. I know he's, he's very opposed to, um, the government in uh, Iran, Iran, which yeah. is perfectly reasonable. They are pretty terrible. So it may be that, or he's quite maybe just the, active. He's also not yeah. white, which is also um, yeah. But yeah, did you have fun doing that? I did. I really enjoyed it. It was a bit. Um, <clears throat> I thought I sort of got out there, and I thought, "Fucking hell, I've only done three gigs this year." 
Mm -hmm. I'm not, uh, you know, you, you know, you, if you perform every night, you get so much more match fit so that, you know, yeah. any, any interruption, anything happens. And I wasn't in that state, but I, I did a fair amount of new material and you know, being MC is, um, is a thing I'm useful, not in the, in the moderns. I, you know, I don't do crowd work and all that bullshit, mm. but, um, you know, yeah, I kept things going. I think between, yeah, it was, it was. I really enjoyed it, especially towards the end. I think I got, I think I got warmed up. The audience got warmed up, and uh, would you be up for in the in the next year to do a couple? I don't know. It's difficult. Uh, no live podcasts. Oh, live podcasts with me. Yes, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah they're a lot easier do than doing yeah. stand up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Just need a good guest, a bit yeah. of Q and A. Yeah. Um, Let's can we make that a New Year's resolution? Let's yeah, let's do some make live that. shows. Yeah, maybe I'll even uh, I could plan us a little mini tour or something. All right, if you want. Okay. Yeah, why not? Yeah, be easier than yeah. So I can't really, you know, I did sort of had a <clears throat> a tour of I don't want to, I had a tour of big venues penciled in, and I just cancelled it really because I didn't feel um I didn't really feel up to. The material was all working and stuff, really. I just, um, I don't know. I just, it's, um, I didn't feel in the mood for it, really. So, but I, I have to, yeah. I mean, I, I do feel an obligation in a sense to perform. I think if you have a, if you have a talent like mine, you should exercise it. Yes. But look, you've done your years. I mean, you've, you've, Given so much, I've been in the show British business. Public. Yeah, I have. Bastards. You've done so much. You've set shit so much groundwork yeah. for other comedians. Yeah, it's not like you owe anyone anything. No, I suppose not. But, um, but um, yeah, if you can do it, you should kind of keep doing it. But I've, I've been in show business for forty-five years. It's ridiculous. He's seventy now. Seventy-one. Oh shit! <laughs> yeah. Linda Whoa. told me to stop doing that voice. She hates Oh, it. did she? Yeah. All oh, right. Okay. Sorry for prompting you then. That's all right. I quite, yeah, I think I, yeah. <laughs> well, it's Christmas. <laughs> yeah. It's Christmas, isn't it? It's Christmas. Um, I don't cry this just for a few minutes. So oh, I've got to me if my dog died. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hear that? What? Some little jingling of bells. As, I think it's the uh, the, cr the crim Crimbus Capaldi sleigh uh, uh, on the uh, rooftop. Do you hear that, Alexi? I do. I hear it now. Now you mention it, yeah. <laughs> I think the uh, yeah. You saying we should get get the fuck on with this? <laughs> Christmas Capaldi's coming down the chimney. Right, I think he's... he's in the living room. <laughs> he's got a knife. No. <laughs> <laughs> Put it down. No, we'll listen. We'll listen. I swear. <laughs> oh. uh -huh. Um. Yeah. Let's throw to it, man. Come on. We've we've All teased right. it. We've left yeah. the listeners dangling. All right. Merry what, what are we going to? Yeah. Merry Christmas, Capaldi. Here we go. Episode one. Dream Boys. <laughs> So, uh, in a desperate attempt to address our falling listening figures. What? <laughs> this is really our last chance, I think, to make the big time. I have managed to... <laughs> I have managed to persuade Peter Capaldi to come on my podcast. And apparently this is the first podcast you've ever done. First one ever that yeah. I remember. <laughs> maybe some, maybe somebody, somebody out there is going to go. Oh, he did ours. Or, yeah, that's a whole pile on it. But I don't remember. Well, that's technology true. moves so quickly and changes. So yeah, it doesn't seem much different from being on the radio, really. Except it's in my ass. Yeah, it's yeah, but so it's, it's it's the same. <laughs> well, I also thought that I would largely make this about me, really, rather than sure. <laughs> so we could talk about when we first met and okay. what you think of me and <laughs> the part this is normal. I, this is the way it goes. <laughs> the part I played in your career, and, yeah. <laughs> well, or not? Well, we could well, we'll start first... there and then go back. Really, when we reminisce about when we met. 
Well, when we met is uh, was different from when I first saw you. Because we met when uh, we were in the, the ITV show Selling Hitler. Uh, and you were playing uh, the man who had... The forger, Connie Kuya. Who had forged Hitler's diaries and mm -hmm. sold them to Stern. And I was playing a, some journalist or other in that. Uh, that's when we met. Um, but I'd seen you before. That I'd, uh, I'd been in the audience uh, at the... Raymond Review Bar. Oh right, okay. To uh, see uh, you in the comic strip perform, mm. which I thought was amazing. It was uh, I'd never seen anything like that really. I didn't know what this was. You know, it was uh, the, at that time, which I guess would have been 18, 1980. 1980. Um, the idea that people could get up on stage in a little black painted room with a microphone and conjure up this whole world of comedy uh, that wasn't you know mother-in-law jokes and frilly shots and all that was was brand was brand new so and of course you were a sort of dazzling <laughs> star in that firm yeah. that time, among you know uh, and you were the the host of the evening and and, and, and held it together with a kind of a, belligerence and, and sort of brilliance and uh, were amazing and it was you know and Rick Mayle was there who was astounding you know and I, it was just all this fantastic stuff I thought this is a bit like seeing I don't know Elvis or something you know it's like yeah. uh, it's a he agrees yeah yeah he agrees. Agrees. <laughs> this was at the comedy yeah. store the old comedy no, store no comic strip the comic strip yeah and that was a separate venue that was late oh, that was a year later yeah, yeah. So that was uh, where I first saw you. And then, in fact, we sort of met because your wife, Elaine, yeah. played my girlfriend. That's right. And so we, I don't know, because I don't think we had any scenes together, but I, I had scenes with Elaine. You had scenes with, with, yeah, you had scenes with Elaine. And she and, told me how much. And, and you, and you seemed to get on quite well. Yeah. Uh, I, I famously told her she wasn't famous enough to come to the rap party. <laughs> she could you? come as, yeah, she still goes on about it. <laughs> I said she. I said she could come as your guest, right? But she couldn't. Her part was too insignificant for her to come. Well, that was a little cruel. <laughs> I think it set the template for. And I was only joking. Were you? <laughs> yeah. I was only mostly joking. Mostly joking. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we met through uh, Elaine. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And we've been firm. together since. You've been together since. Yeah. yeah. That's true. So well, I mean, so. Having having talked about me, go back. <laughs> <laughs> having satiated that uh, desire, I mean that's uh, it. By the way, <laughs> yeah. So when that was that too. part when you were in uh, the show together? When 1990 was nineteen ninety. It was pre your sketch show. I uh, know it was after. It was after two series of my sketch. Oh yeah, and we did your sketch show as well. You very you kindly invited me to, yeah, be on, which was great fun, which I loved because yeah. that whole, oh, but that whole sort of um. Uh, let's call it alternative comedy thing was a very radical and exciting uh, world and I was desperate to be part of it but um, only ever managed to puncture it through through you through your benevolence well that's with this you're, you're in that you're in the Sherlock Holmes sketch and you in is that show. with also with double award, Oscar award winner Christoph Waltz is he in that sketch or is he in it I don't think one? he's in that he's in it. It, it it's the one where you're trying to get more money out of me you're that's right. Oh, am I Watson and you're Holmes or you're Holmes? I'm Holmes and you're right, Watson. Right. And I can remember the uh, keenly that the uh, when my, when I went to play um, the comedy Sherlock Holmes in your in this sketch, the makeup lady said, "I've got a tub of nose wax here." She said, "So that I can give you a, a, a big nose oh. if, if you so require." And then she looked at my nose and went, "No, you're fine." <laughs> That's also we tried to employ both me and the crew are socially maladroit. I always try and use you try and use yeah. The Adam was smoking as well at the time. Really. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, to go back, I mean to you, I mean to go back to the to I guess to um, I was vaguely thinking about questions I would ask you that you come from 
a community of Italian migrants to Scotland. Yeah. 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 My grandfather was uh, Italian. Yeah. Uh, he married a Scottish woman. He came from um, a little village called Piccinisco in, in, in Italy, which is uh, uh, in the mountains south of Rome. Uh, I think he went to America, first of all. Uh, but as ever, these kind of family tales are veiled in mystery. And, and especially in those days, I think you could disappear by just, you know, moving to Carlisle or something. Right. And you could say you'd gone to America. Um, but his, I guess, uh, his, 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 his cousins and brothers were uh, what we call economic migrants. They were looking for... Um, to, to, to earn a living because much as I mean having been to to to, to Piginisco, which is gorgeous in Italy there isn't really much there in terms of work or a future or there wasn't at that time uh, and he was a, a shepherd and he actually didn't even uh, live in the village um, so uh, I think it was a case of uh, there was a uh, they could there was a better life elsewhere and so I think there was a trail blazed by various uh, cousins and brothers who set up cafes. And, you know, it was a kind of traditional business. I mean, Scottish Italians are all in either um, fish and chips uh, or ice cream or hairdressing. You don't want to get them mixed up. Because <laughs> you don't want hair in your ice cream, obviously, or hair in your chips. <laughs> so I think Paolo Nettini is... Uh, you know, from a fish and chip family. Right. Uh, I think Tom Conte, I think, is from a hairdressing family. Right. Uh, uh, and I'm from ice celebrated family. ice cream family. Yeah. Mm. Capaldi's ice cream. And, and Armando Iannucci lived around the corner, the producer. Armando, well, I didn't really know. Arma I mean, Arma the funny thing was, uh, we, for the first eight years of my life, I lived in a tenement in Glasgow in a in a very kind of in that kind of classic kind of uh, old tenement kind of style uh, lifestyle, which was, which I loved, which was absolutely, I mean, my granny, my mother's, my father's mother lived to, you know, downstairs and my mother's mother lived across the road uh, and all my uncles lived uh, within walking distance. So all my cousins. And was it like a little Italy or was it? That no, was, it wasn't no. a little Italy at all. Yeah. Not at all. I mean, that's a kind of, you know, nobody spoke Italian. They weren't really. They was. Everybody was just Scottish. You were, so you you didn't have a sense of being part of a community, of being part of a kind of either no. what, Catholic or. Oh, Italian. Catholic! Yeah, very, very much Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. Because my mother was really of, of Irish uh, heritage. Right. So we were we were doomed to Catholicism, <laughs> <laughs> whatever we did. Um, so, uh, but no, they we weren't kind of. Uh, uh, I guess that that's the beginning of my, you know. Uh, long-standing inauthenticity <laughs> in the world yeah. because people would always uh, meet you and think you came from a, a, a family with an accordion playing father and uh, you know and a cafe and, 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 and made ate spaghetti all the time yeah. and all that but we didn't but it was a little bit mysterious because my grandfather died when I was 18 so I never met him but there were these kind of haunting pictures of him and he had this kind of quite dark kind of look about him. And my grandmother, who was very Scottish, I know had been in Italy for quite a while, but I could never piece all these bits together. How had she been in Italy and what had gone on in Italy? Mm. Uh, but, um, and of course, you know, you start, the sad thing is you get older and people, you know, leave us and you don't have anybody to question about this stuff no, anymore. No. But it was a great, Oh, just say a word from our sponsors, Ancestry.com. You, can, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't, you, did you feel any urge to um, make their migration worth it or anything? or like? You know, they no, came, these weren't issues that were uh, raised uh, at all. People mm -hmm. just got, you know, we're just getting on with whatever. You know, just, my so grandfather you know, and, my, and his sons all worked every hour God sent, you know, in, 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 in shops or cafes or... Yeah. You know, making ice cream. What I loved was the, you know, they used to they used to say that um, there was a special recipe for our ice cream that had been brought from Italy, and was kept under lock and key somewhere. But in fact, walls. 
Well, it was large plastic bags of powder that came from slow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, they'd mixed up in a vat. <laughs> <laughs> did you, where did they sell it? Did you have a cafe or a, a van or what? We had, uh, I think my grandfather originally had one of those, you know, great shop. No, what, what's, what's the, the, the Marx brother who's uh, Chico? Oh, right. uh, Chico's often seen with a, with a nice <laughs> barrel. Right. My, 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 my grandfather, Giovanni, had a, had a barrel. Right. Which he sold ice cream wow. from, and then eventually um, they had um, a cafe uh, in beneath the same tenement that we lived in, uh, uh, and and then we had a, a, an ice cream. I use this word advisedly, factory. Right. It was a kind of <laughs> cobblestone petal spell. <laughs> a workshop. <laughs> workshop. Yeah. But if the ice cream would only be retailed through the Capaldi Cafe. It was the po- no, no, we had yeah. vans. Oh, you had vans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Ooh. So we had Capaldi's ice cream vans. All right. Eventually. So you moved, so was that was that when the fleet of vans came, I assume, that you moved into? We moved into, uh, yeah, to Bishop Briggs, which was a, a sort of suburban kind of uh, uh, wimpy house kind of uh, enclave. Right. Full wow. of taxi drivers and stuff like that. Was that like a big wrench? I don't, I don't know. I think for my, you know, I think for my, my parents, they were, that was the right move to make because they wanted to get away from, uh, this was in the days before, you know, the tenements were crumbling. Some years later, a decade later, they were being rebuilt and sandblasted and turned into nice homes for people and stuff like that. Yeah. But mm. they were sort of crumbling and a bit uh, too busy and... Uh, so I think to move into a nice house was kind of everybody's ambition. And they did that. Uh, and then you progressed through school and you went to the, you then went to the famous Glasgow Art School. I did. I went to art school, but that was only because I, uh, I didn't get into drama school. Really? I was rejected by drama school. Well, soundly. By, uh, fucking idiot. <laughs> Shows well, you. Well, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe the gods were smiling. Yeah, I, I was know. rejected from film school. Were you? Yeah. That's a terrible. And I ended up teaching at one of the ones film schools that had rejected me. And what did you teach? I was teaching bitterness. Te- yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Repercussions. Repercussions. I was teaching. Yeah. It was London School of uh, London School of Printing. <laughs> okay. Um, they had a film school which they rejected me from, and then I was the next year I was there as a teacher. I was teaching printing apprentices general studies so it wasn't like mm. but I think I think for a while they got a bit worried because they thought that I'd just I'd refused their rejection and just turned up <laughs> I refused not to go <laughs> so I remember the first time encountering yeah. one of the lecturers who turned me down and him looking a bit worried anyway that's not the end of it <laughs> well of but, course I later I later met the people who had uh Rejected me. I think they were quite right to reject me. I didn't, yeah, I know, think I, right. at the time yeah. I didn't yeah. think that. Yeah. But I think they were quite. I think I was hopeless. Yeah, mm. well, I, I, funny enough, yeah, I think that all the film. I mean, I applied to Royal College Film School after I left Chelsea. The that film school in Beaconsfield, the National, yeah, and then later London College of Printing Film School. I think they were all right, right yeah. to reject me really, yeah. because I wasn't ready. You know. Yeah. How about now? Are you ready now? Yeah, well, I think I would just go straight to. Well, I often say, I mean, sometimes like I, you know, I'm like a, I collect honorary professorships. I I've didn't got know four, that. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a hobby of mine. Okay. Uh, I've got four. And then I say to the people, like I'm a fellow of the, um, the you know, the, uh, what's they called? The, the, you know, the St. Martin's, Central St. Martin's in Chelsea. And I forget what it's called, University of the Arts. And I would say, oh yeah, you know, I'd love to come and teach. You know, I'm a trained teacher because I've trained to be a lecturer. And they say, yeah, yeah, you know, we'd love to come and teach. So, and then, then, then nobody ever, 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 ever gets in touch with me. Mm. So, had you been accepted by film school? Yeah. What oeuvre would you have pursued? I think I was so. I mean, it would have been. It would, I would have been. I would have. If I had been accepted at film school, I would have. After the first term and the Christmas term, I would have had to go in front of the board, and I would have been asked to leave. Really. <laughs> why, why, why because I, I was so chaotic and I, you know but you must have had some you must have had some 
imaginary vision of yourself as I don't think I did. I think I just David want Lean, who no, famously, just uh, who you famously am, um, <laughs> put to sleep. Yeah, I haven't told that story. Yeah, <laughs> well, I think you should. <laughs> Although I've given away the end of it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe another. We'll maybe save another, it for another, another time. Yeah. But you must have, if you thought, you, you can't go to film school, was it just something to do? I think I felt it was, yeah, it, was, it felt like it was, it, 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 it should have been the next step. And instead I was, on, you know, I was kind of, on, I did odd jobs uh, for the next five years really, but I think that that was, I mean, I, I am eternally grateful for that, for that rejection really. So how did you get from being rejected? from film school to being a stand-up comedian? Um, well, this isn't about me. Who's it to but, uh, <laughs> but seeing as we haven't, we haven't oh. discussed this. You see, that's one of the things, isn't it? We've known each other, yeah. see each other most weeks, but yeah. never. Um, well, uh, so I left Chelsea in summer of 74. And then I yeah, applied to film. I had a year off, worked in the civil service, and then I applied to film school in 75, whenever it was rejected. So then 76, 77, 78, 79, I just, just did odd jobs, filing and did a bit of part-time lecturing and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. 79, the comedy store opened because I was in a, I was in a, a friend of mine asked me to be in a Brechtian cabaret troupe and oh, yeah. I started doing, I started doing stand-up within the troupe really. Okay. And then the, the, when I auditioned for the comedy store and they offered me the job of MC mm-hmm. and then that year later that led to the comic strip that we talked about before, but I think that I built in those five years of unemployment, I built up a tremendous well of kind of resentment and anger, and it was a really terrific experience. I think to not be heard. You know, I've never talked about this before, actually, but I mean, it's, I think it's to to, to to seize with resentment that you and that nobody's like treat because I was like doing really, I mean, cleaning toilets, washing dishes, shit like that. To be unheard was a tremendous motivator, I think, really, you know. But how do you, you know, you say that, but you, you also said you auditioned for the comic strip. Now, it takes a lot to audition. You know, it's like the stories when people say, how did you become an actor? Or oh, I went and my mate was auditioning and yeah. I was there as well. And then yeah. they said to me, really? Is that really what happened? You no. went with your yeah. mate to, you know, and they just said, you have a go. So what I'm saying is, it takes a certain set of mind to to audition so what was that no, well because i'd already been doing this show with this other actor bill right and we've been touring it around like student unions and and in that show it was a sketch show but i would step out and do what turned out to be stand-up so i had yeah i had a, a large body of material ready to go and that's what i did for my audition oh. at the comedy store yeah so i had i had like and was it an ad in the newspaper or something in private eye yeah yeah. I. yeah, yeah, but no, I had, I'd had tons of experience. I'd, I'd had loads of experience of really difficult, hostile audiences, and you know, knowing that this material was really that nobody else was doing it and stuff. So no, I wasn't, I wasn't an ingenue, and I, you know, I was, ex, I was really experienced by the time they asked me to, to hmm. be MC of the comedy store. But what was the fuel then? Was it this rage? Was it this was yeah. it? Because yeah. you can't, you don't get up in front of an audience with just yourself and a microphone oh, yeah. without some degree of courage and, 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 and some fuel that uh, makes you meet that challenge. Have you ever thought of having a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, well, so there's the rage and resentment. There's a tremendous desire to, to, be, to be heard, but also there's the knowledge that I knew I was fucking brilliant. I, I knew I was really good. <laughs> 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 not necessarily you see me I'm not necessarily this, I mean I'm a lot better than I used to be but in I'm not one of them you know in a social situation I can be um, awful I can cast a terrible poll but uh, you know on a stage I knew that I could really I knew from the first yeah. moment I started doing it that I was fucking better than anybody else really. what you said isn't universal you go to open mics now you see a lot of just blind entitlement and like mm. People who, who who might believe that they're the, the bollocks, but then they've not got anything, no fire in them, nothing yeah. to to really say that's unique. So I'm sitting there going, okay. So some people have been told their whole life they're great. It sounds like you needed to be, or you told yourself that, that. Yeah, yeah, I needed that affirmation. But back to you, Peter. What what mm. propelled you then, Peter? Yeah, Capaldi. Um. 
I mean, were, were your parents happy that you went in, went to art school for starters? Um, they were happy because they thought I could be a teacher. Right. Because you are a fantastic artist as well. Well, that's fair. It's really good to say. Um, I think I was very lucky that I was born at a certain time. Mm, I was born okay. in 1958. And so, therefore, higher education was seen as um, a right and mm. was paid for by the government and also was seen as a thing that you, you pushed your kids to do. Yeah. I mean, my parents were, were, in essence, very ordinary people. But every one of their kids went to university or, or, or art college. Uh, they didn't have the money to pay for that. No. And they didn't, it wasn't a loan, you know, but it was still part of that post-war rebuilding mm. of, uh, of, of the country and, of, and, and, and just, oops. It's so unprofessional. You see, that shows you the unprofessional <laughs> of podcasting. Welcome to the Alexis yeah. Sale podcast. <laughs> text. I wonder who it's from. Oh, come on. Did you do all like the school plays and shit at school? No, we didn't have school plays. We did eventually have one. You know, people. You know, we. Our school was fairly limited in its mm. resources and in and in its. Uh, it's another world. Were you always it's a another... performer growing up? Like a show off or doing skits for the yeah, family. Yeah, I think and stuff. I, I, you know, I, I've tried to think about this and see. I think I, I think I liked to perform, mm. but my, when I was a little kid, um, I had a little shoebox, uh, which I cut the front off of, and a, a shoebox is a thing that shoots. Come in. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I wasn't. I don't know what you thought. <laughs> It's a cardboard. We still have those now. Do we? Yeah. It's an oblong cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> Was it one per shoe or? You could put two shoes. Whoa! Two shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but I cut the front off of it, and with a little biro pen, I drew a, a, a studio. Because huh. at the time there was a show called Ready Steady Go, which was like sort of pre Top of the Pops which is where pop groups appeared. And then I, I drew a little Beatles and made little Beatles. And I made, because it also on Ready Steady Go, it was it, it set that thing of being able to see the cameras. You'd see the cameras, oh, the, the yeah. pop group would be playing and the, the Beatles would be playing or the Stones would be playing and the cameras would be ranging around as well. And I used mm. to play with, it, with, with these. I made this all myself. And I think I was just looking for some expression of this uh, creativity that I had. But there was no um, history of it. My uncle, my uncle Peter, who I was named after, was actually a, uh, had, had been in the war and been in Ensa uh, with Frankie Howard, uh, and had been a singer, uh, had been a crooner uh, before giving up to become an ice cream man. Uh, and uh, he also painted, uh, and he would encourage me to draw and paint. Uh, and my, 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 my mysterious grandmother, who apparently had been to Italy mysteriously, kept going on about how it was, it, it was Italian to, uh, to draw and paint and, 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 and the mm. Da Vinci and Michelangelo and all this, but it all be Italian. <laughs> she herself was from Ayrshire. <laughs> 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 so I think there was just this well of creativity, which was also performing. Yeah. But I wasn't particularly a, a show off or, or, or a class clown or anything like that. Yeah. Just I just wanted to do something. I didn't want to stand at a bus stop. I have a very, you know, powerful, you know, sense of remembering. I didn't want to stand in a bus stop in the rain going to the same job every day. I wanted to break out of that. Mm. Uh, and that was a common story. And a lot of people were doing that, you know. So I was looking for a way. Uh and it might have been music, or it might have been, uh, you know, acting, or, or it might have been art. It was just a way to, to deploy the, whatever gifts I had. And so you applied and got into the GSA. I got well. I, yeah, I applied to dra to drama school and, and went oh, yeah. and and uh, uh, to uh, Central oh, and to Rada, 
But of course, it was it was hopeless from the start because nobody <laughs> had never seen a Shakespeare play. I'd hardly been to the, a play at all. I'd only ever seen pantomimes in Glasgow. Uh, I wasn't interested really in being a, a, a you know a Chekhovian actor. Mm. I was just interested in you know having a bit of a spotlight and and and, and being on the telly maybe, yeah. you know. Uh, and uh, so when I asked to do a, a modern piece, I had no idea even what. <laughs> <laughs> what a modern play was uh, and so I had to go and look all that up and Shakespeare well that was hopeless I just did some terrible found some Shakespeare thing and did it uh, and it was awful um, so they were quite right to say forget it there are other kids here who are serious about this but you see I think um, th- uh, creativity comes in all shapes and forms uh, and that you know, I was an actor, and I am an actor, and it's it's what I've done mm-hmm. most of my life, uh, and I think I've. You know, I was terrible then, and then I was a little bit less terrible, and I got a little bit. The more I did, still occasionally absolutely terrible, and then it was shocking, and then got a bit better, and then just by practice, you know, one began to get a bit better. So um, I wasn't wrong to pursue that ambition. Sorry, I've forgotten the, the question. No, it was supposed How to be did about I go to art, art school? school. Yeah, and what did you what did you think was going to happen there, and who did you? Uh, did I went. I was. Out? I couldn't. I was rejected by drama school, which broke my heart. But I was slightly relieved. Yeah. <laughs> it's a weird mix. Did you come down? To, I mean, did, yeah, I did came down to London, down to, uh, which was a mysterious, strange kind of. Place. And where did you stay and stuff? I don't think I stayed over. I think I might have just come down and got the train. Cause and got the train over so, Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, and when I can remember standing on Swiss Cottage Tube Station uh, platform after the audition, and gradually all the other people who were rejected came oh, onto the platform, man. and we sort of nodded uncomfortably to each other. <laughs> then I went off. That was from Central. That was yeah. Central for yeah, my separate yeah, yeah. ways. Um, so I didn't really have a plan about what uh, where I would go, but uh, my art teacher at school, uh, uh, Mr. Boyle, who was lovely, who'd always been a kind of champion of my drawing said well you should go to go to art school and i and i looked into it and, and found that the di- i'd missed the date for the for the delivery of the folio and he said well i'll phone them up and say we've got you should they should have a look so he phoned them up and they looked at uh, i threw together a folio and i got him so i don't know but it was the best thing it was the right thing to do it worked out well because i loved art school and as you know that's just a whole different ethos. There. I mean, the, the irony was that actually, before train spotting, actors were quite uncool. Kids really? didn't want to be actors, right. particularly you know Scottish kids. So there wasn't a kind of there. Was, when I was at art school, and we'd see people from the drama school. They were like cardigans and stuff like that, and they weren't cool, and they didn't, mm. you know, they didn't have a kind of edge to them. They were, and they spoke in that kind of odd sort of way. So I very quickly abandoned any ambition in that and recognised that this kind of cauldron of, of of creativity was much more me, and was certainly cooler. Uh, I mean, we always had the impression that in Scottish art schools they still still taught you stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which they didn't, which Chelsea had completely abandoned that kind of pedagogic notion, really. That, uh, but, so you did, you had life drawing and... We did that. have life drawing. Uh, I think it was uh, already beginning to be seen as a, a, a bit uh, pointless. There was a, there was a wave of, of, of teachers that we had who were uh, uh, obsessed with conceptualism. I'm saying all this, now I didn't know this at the time, I wasn't going, oh, we're not getting that conceptualist English guy again teaching us. Right. We're just going, oh, that's that twat's coming and he's <laughs> drawing on about all of that stuff. But now I recognise what was happening was yeah, we yeah, were yeah. being well, uh, cultivated bit. and driven yeah. into a conceptualist kind of uh, uh, corner. You mean, by, you mean performance art or kind of like... Land, like I mean in terms yeah, of uh, painting and drawing. Right. And of course I was hopeless because I, I had a sort of gift which of course I squandered by, you know, going for curries and spending my grant on uh, uh, lager and stuff like that. And uh, uh, 
And you'd, I, I, I remember vividly, you know, what happens, as you know, is you're the best in your class at drawing and then you go to art school mm -hmm. and everybody's oh. the best in their yeah. class. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. So you, you very quickly recognise that some of them are not that good. And you go, oh, well, they're not that good. I'm better than them. And so you go for a drink uh, and then you come back in three months and they're fabulous because they worked. Wow. And they took their, what talent they had and they worked and applied uh, and, and, and blossomed. Um, so I was, I, I was slow to recognise. Took it for granted. I took it for granted. And I was slow to recognise that, that, that labour was the way to discipline. I don't mean that in a heavy kind of way. Yeah. But, you know, that you had, to, you know, Picasso spent, anybody who's a great artist gets up in the morning and, has, and does artwork. All day, yeah. All day long. Yeah, yeah. Every day. Yeah. You know, Van Gogh doesn't go, <laughs> you know, he's up every single day doing that stuff. Yeah. You know. So, the, is it, was it three years or four years? Four years. Four years at GSA. And so, you, I mean, in that time, well, you sort of, you lived, you had to like, you lived in a flat? Uh, in I moved into in a, a flat, yeah, which is what we did. Um, I started, I have to say, we, we, the, the Scottish art schools are different from English art schools. We did a foundation year in the same um, uh, college, whereas I think in England you could go and do a foundation year elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we did a foundation year in, in, in the art school, and then we, I specialised in drawing and painting. But then I was I was so put, badly behaved that they threatened to um, to um, throw me out. Oh, me too. Yeah. I don't like them. So I thought I better get my shit together because uh, I like it here, uh, and uh, and I was moved then to uh, graphics, which I couldn't do, but I could draw. Yeah. So I used to do illustration. So I got a degree in illustration. Oh, okay. And that's why Muriel Gray was uh, was there also. Was she a student there? She was a student there. I thought. Was she? What was she like? <laughs> she very came. glamorous. Really. Very 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 exciting and very uh, uh, sharp and uh, uh, and very creative, very artful. Well, she get her on, I suppose. I think you should. She was, I think she was really good. And of course she got, while we were there, she got a, she got to present the tube, which was... That's why she was still there. Or maybe it was after so she... I think, oh, I met her in like 84. Right. I think when we did the tube. But of course that was shocking to all of us that she could go off and become famous when we were all intending to be famous. <laughs> <laughs> she got in there. She got in there so, I mean, did you, so how did you progress from being an artist to being a performer then? Um, when I was at art school, I went to art school in 1976. Okay. Which was uh, when punk exploded. So we all arrived, uh, I think in the, what was it, 75? We certainly arrived all looking like Neil Young, you know, <laughs> with long hair and, uh, you know, army uh, reject jackets and stuff like that. And then when we came back the next term, uh, punk had happened. So we all had peroxide hair and uh, <laughs> leather trousers and stuff like that. And uh, everybody wanted to be in a band. So I wanted, to, so that was obviously a very clear way to perform uh, and to be creative. So uh, I started a band. So, uh, and that became a kind of obsession. What were they called? And they had the worst name of any band ever. Uh, they were called the Dream Boys, which was, <laughs> this was, this was before, Lovely. obviously, the advent of, uh, of these male stripper groups. And we thought it was, that we were hoping it would be a Kafka-esque kind of night, nightmare-esque. Yeah, like living in a dream. Dr. Caligari-esque yeah. kind of thing. But it wasn't. It just became this terrible name, which has haunted me ever since. Yeah, right. But it was great fun to do, you know, because mm. everybody did it. Where did you? I mean, Craig played, Ferguson was one of your. Craig was the drummer. Yeah, yeah. and oh, we, right. yeah, and we played in it, the art school. We played all over Glasgow. We did lots and lots of gigs. And you were uh, uh, bass. You know, I know. I, I, I was. I sung and and uh, played guitar and you know all that. Were uh, your own songs or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How'd that go down? They were terrible. They were absolutely. <laughs> I mean, they, 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 we, we, you know, they were terrible songs, and uh, uh, I didn't know any. You just got up and you did them. I'm amazed now when I think about it. 
Do you remember <laughs> what you sang about? What were the topics? And oh yeah. Do you remember anything? Of course I do. Yeah, Come we on. had a song called uh, "Outer Limits," which was a kind of pastiche of the. Uh, there was a TV show called Outer Limits, which oh, was yeah. a kind of sci-fi fantasy thing. Uh, so that was a song about someone who has found himself trapped in a TV show. <laughs> 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 what kind of musical genre would you play? To? Because this was what was musically we influences. <laughs> well, we had our own genre. <laughs> yeah, it was called. We did. We did. The fight really? had our own genre. It was called Bizarro Punk. Okay. Because wow. we loved people like the Cramps and stuff. Right. Like I went to see the Cramps, yeah. who were amazing, and they always had a kind of slightly retro kind of uh, uh, B movie kind of quality about mm-hmm. them. So we kind of pursued that, uh, but also we, we also thought we were a bit like talking heads and all that kind of right. stuff. Yeah. But we weren't really. We didn't sort of work hard enough to. We just enjoyed the. The fun of it, but yeah. we kind of did it. You know, it was a full time thing. It really? Was, yeah, and it you was, made and money. No. What sense was it full time? It was a full time. We made money. We never got signed <laughs> up. Or I mean, I used to always have to come to London with cassettes and go around record companies right. and try. Wow. And just after a few years, you just go, oh, I can't do this anymore. No one would sign. You know, it seemed everybody was getting signed up, and we weren't getting signed up, and it got harder and harder and harder. Did you have like a small group of fans who follows you everywhere? Yeah. 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 Everybody, oh. but my, but my most... everybody, no matter how shit. I mean, that's what Flight to the Concords partly revealed, wasn't it? Everybody, no, I'm not saying you were shit, but yeah. everybody, no matter how shit, has a little group of fans. Yeah, well, what's funny but... is you don't realise, you know, the, go- the, the gods of rock and roll, you know, play games and tricks, yeah. you know, aren't you? So, you know, for instance, Craig, when he joined the band... Craig came from Cumbernauld, which was a satellite town of Glasgow. He thought that joining a Glasgow band was a big deal. <laughs> so relative. That simply by joining a Glasgow band, he was taking two or three steps towards Top of the Pops or something right, like that. Right. Uh, which, of course, he was just joining another floundering <laughs> Glaswegian wow. band. But then, of course, we would be desperate to support you get on a good, you get a good uh, yeah. support gig of some of like that. But then there would be bands who would support us. Wow. And I was going, well, they, they were even farther down the food chain than us, which was unbelievable. And I remember, and this is where the gods of rock and roll play um, tricks on you. I did, um, we got a gig in Grainsmouth, which is a kind of, you know, it's Refinery like... Refinery town. It's like the start of Blade Runner. Yeah. The original Blade Runner. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's like yeah. that, you know, with all the kind of flames yeah. going off and stuff like that. On a smaller Scottish scale. Yeah. Uh, and there was a hotel down there where uh, they were doing... I mean, the thing about at that time, which you've got to understand, is Glasgow District Council had banned punks from playing. So there was a period when you couldn't... There weren't any gigs in Glasgow itself. Uh, because they were so horrified by the idea wow. of this uh, th- this radical kind of violent movement taking over and and and, and terrorizing the uh, the population, so there were, there were a lot of gigs sprang up all over the place, um, but there was one in Grangemouth which was a hotel I can't remember what it was called, and we got this gig there, uh, and it was a, a sort of rundown um, Victorian hotel with a little ballroom which was not much bigger than than the room that we're in now and in the corner there was a little stage <laughs> so you set up there uh and uh and of course because we were a glasgow band and we were making the yeah. trip to range we time, were a big yeah. deal and we yeah, had to yeah. hire a van and all that kind yeah. of stuff and get down there with all of our gear but i was concerned that we were getting a split on the door and i was concerned about the that we weren't going to make any money because because we had to pay for the van etc. Uh, because there wasn't a lot of people there. There were the Grangemouth punks, who were, I guess were about a dozen kids. Did they support you? Though? They, they yeah. were not favourably on you. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Well, they came because that was the only gig yeah. that was there. And we among them was our support band, who we'd asked, uh, who, who, who we'd oh. booked, and one of them, and they and I remember they they were so lovely and so sweet, uh, and they played for us. And then when we came on. I say came on when we stepped in. <laughs> stepped, in, stepped into the corner. When we exchanged places in the corner, 
and they stayed and they danced and all that and were very supportive. And then at the end of the night, I, I, they gave the, the promoter gave me the money, promoter, I don't know, the hotel owner guy gave me the money and there wasn't enough money to pay for the van. There wasn't enough money to, there certainly wasn't enough money to play the support band. So I thought, well, we'll just have to make do a runner here. I can't tell them the truth because I can't. <laughs> I can't destroy their belief in that they're, they're with a big Glasgow band. So I said, well, I'll keep them talking, and you guys back up the stuff, and then we'll make. It. So I had to keep the, the support band talking, uh, and while I kept them and avoiding the topic of money, and then when it when I realised that the van was packed up, I said, I've just got to go to the loo, uh, and then I jumped in the van oh and God, off we that's went. Terrible. Yeah, and it was the Cocktail Twins, of really? course, really? who became yeah. who were fantastic yeah. and became very celebrated. And the gods of rock and roll took them to their hearts. Oh, and, you know, wow! Do they, have you seen them since? Have they reminisced about you? No, them? but I'd like to apologise to them. Yeah, yeah, you publicly. Make, well, I, I always, actually it did events. always bother me, irrespective of yeah. the fact of them becoming famous. It always bothered me that I had to do that, and I always hated being part of that part of the business. Yeah, but no. there was no money. Yeah, I uh, yeah. I think you should make things, amends. All done things we regret. I think you need yeah. to step nine. Yeah. yeah. So and also, you're only kids as well. Yeah. You're only really what age? Twenty two, twenty three. That's something. really really fucked up, Peter. <laughs> 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 so and then so so what happened next? Um, we've only got to you with. We've only, with what year are we now? What year is the, 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 the disgraceful treatment of the Cocteau <laughs> Twins? <laughs> the stabbing in the back. I've lost Emma, lost their cocktail. I know. It's so awful of me to do that. Um, I don't know how much I owe them. <laughs> you <laughs> can probably afford to give it to them. 50 or something like that. Um, what happened then? Well, we just kept doing gigs. I left art school. Uh, I graduated from art school. Uh, but really wanted to, you know, keep doing the music thing. Uh, and I got odds and ends of jobs at the BBC doing, uh, uh, they, they used to have short term contracts where you could do, um, so I used to work for the graphics department and do oh, illustrations okay. for them. Yeah. But I would use all the equipment for making album sleeves and, and record covers and posters and stuff like that. For your band? Yeah. Okay, they're still going. Okay. Yeah. Um, but while I was in the band, we were doing, uh, we fell into uh, altered images who were around at the time who were very sweet to us and Claire Grosvenor who were all lovely to us and uh, all the bands were lovely to us you know they always really? they, always, they always take us comedians are fucking horrible yeah too, no all the bands were really sweet and everybody because everybody who was successful would you know give you a, a slot or whatever really? like and, and altered images were really sweet and uh, they we did some we did a little tour supporting them and uh, uh and then we did a support, we supported them in Glasgow or something. And uh, Bill Forsyth, who was a film director, uh, who directed Gregory's Girl, was at this gig, I think. Um, I say I think because a lot of my memories are uh, occluded with, a, with, with alcohol, which was flowing very freely at the time. Um, uh, and oh. Bill struck me, struck up a conversation with me about this and that after the gig. And then some months passed and then I was uh, I, I rented a room in a, f a flat in Glasgow and, I, and I, I came home one night again the worst for wear for uh, with, with alcohol and uh, and uh, Bill was there and um, I think I regaled him with tales of my he life he was there by accident yeah. no he wasn't there by accident he was there because my landlady was also a costume designer and she'd been the costume designer on his latest um. film thing uh, so that's he was there seeing her. So so Bill Forsyth is there. Yeah. Oh, co coincidentally, also lived in a sort of house that was behind Muriel Gray's house for many years. Yes, Muriel's a constant, uh, constant uh, theme in this in our lives. Presence, yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, or indeed, you know, Glasgow's quite a smart. It's funny. I was reading a book <laughs> the other day about um, creation records. Alan McGee, right. who I can't see as this, you know, you know, manager of Oasis and all that stuff like that. And I'm reading this book, and he's in a band that supported us in Glasgow, no. or maybe we supported them. I can't remember. But you go, well, this is a whole milieu that there was a lot of people doing stuff, and it was a very 
It was a very creative time. Mm. But that's one of the extraordinary things, isn't it, in a way about, I suppose, the arts, and particularly in Britain, is that something that's just, like in Liverpool yeah. or... Glasgow, then suddenly kind of explodes and people are listening to the end product in Caracas or, you know, fucking Kyoto or wherever it is. Yeah. It's well, I mean, you, I mean, how do you, I mean, if you went to art school, what did your parents think about, about you going to art school? I mean, was that a surprise? Um, no, I think they were. Well, my mum went to my interview for foundation. I didn't go because I was away hitchhiking across Europe or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they were happy that I went to art school. They always, they always. I mean, I was. I mean, my mother always had that this idea that I was, you know, unique. I mean, I was always. I was a very spoiled child in a way. Very indul. I was both indulged and kind of relentlessly criticised. So I mean, I was. But I think I was always encouraged with the idea that I had a unique vision, you know, which needed to be communicated, which turned out to be true. So where did you go then? Did you did you do a foundation in Liverpool? Well, I was sort of expelled from school. Or well, they told me I couldn't come back. It's a, right. anyway, which that's quite expulsion, but told me not to come back. Um, so I went and did two years foundation at Southport, you know, a little town in Lancashire, right? Which was the happiest time of my life in many ways, right? And then I was interviewed for. I, well, that's interesting talking to you about that experience of coming down and auditioning for drama schools mm-hmm. because I had that. It's a weird kind of day in your life or whatever when you come down to London. Where I had it where I came down and auditioned for Chelsea. Yeah. I think I actually had friends in London. I was going to stay overnight, but in the end... I remember going back to some bloke lured me back to his flat after the audition, and he had a 16 mil film projector <laughs> somewhere in Notting Hill Gate. I remember he had a 16 mil. He was going to show me some films, I don't know what, and then I panicked and sort of ran off. Why? And sort of ran to Houston. I remember I'd I'd put I got like my folder, you know them folder. Did you have like yeah, yeah. Red folio? One? Folio is that a folio? Is that? But it's like it's folio, a big it? red one, yeah. big red one, yeah, dark red, yeah, dark burgundy. red, with, burgundy, yeah, yeah, with black corners, yeah. And I had managed to put wheels on mine. Wow. <laughs> so that wheels. I remember running for the last train to Liverpool through Houston, taking some bloke's ankles out with me, with <laughs> me artwork. <laughs> on his little wheels, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and then going back, you know, going. But it's it's the day you, the day you do your interview for art school or the day you audition yeah. for for drama school in London. I think is a particularly for a working class kid is a yeah. is one of the strangest days of your life, really. And also, London is a, you know, yeah. it's, it's like in a Dickens novel. Yeah. You know, you're sort of deposited. I mean, Houston is. I can't go through Houston, and I go through Houston a lot because obviously I still travel up and down yeah. to Glasgow. But the place is so evocative, yeah, and that great kind of glassy mm. kind of floor, yeah, I mean, they're kind uh, of really yeah. And of course, there had been a terrible, um, well, one's parents were always very frightened about you going to London, you know, because they only knew horror stories about what happened to kids there, some of which were true. Um, but you sort of had to do, but it was a it was a different time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I did because I was much more familiar with London, and yeah. Uh, although it was no, I was no less intimidated. I think because I think thought I knew it, and then when I moved down here, I suddenly realised that I didn't. I was just still felt horribly alone. And stuff. Yeah, that's for another day. But uh, yeah, um, so Bill Forsyth, we're in this band. Yeah. Bill Forsyth is round at your gaff. Trying to get off with the costume designer. No, that's not what was happening. No, there. that's not what was happening. We won't, that, we won't put that in then. Bill Forsyth is round at your flat, costume designer. You amuse him immensely with your drunken yeah. shenanigans. Yeah. And uh, some weeks later, I, he, he phones me up and says, um, would you like to be in a film? That's, you didn't, you had no idea that, I no, I didn't really know what to. I mean, think it, one thing would lead to another. No. And you're living in London at this point. No, no, no you're still up there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the film turned out to be a local hero. I know. But it oh, wasn't as shit. Was that your first job? But it wasn't as straightforward as that, because. I love that film. Bill gave me the script to read, which was I I didn't I didn't I didn't really seen the script. I didn't really know how this worked, uh, and. Uh, and uh, 
I kept asking, when is it? When's it happening? Blah, blah. And then it, it all went very quiet. And then um, I thought, well, that's not happening. And then I had to go and do a screen test. Uh, so I had to come down to London. I, I had to come on a, I was put on a plane. Plane? A plane. Go on a shuttle, uh, which was most exciting. People smoking. <laughs> If you smoked, you smoked at the back of the plane. I smoked then, um, and you, uh, I came down to um, to Bray Studios, which was so exciting because that was where I knew they'd filmed all the old Hammer horror movies there. So that was hugely yeah. exciting for me. And I had to do the screen test for this part, uh, and then I didn't know whether it was going to happen or not. And then eventually, for me, said, "Yeah, it was happening." So, and then I was sort of whisked off to this uh, this magical kingdom that was that was the set of Local Hero. Which was where? It was in it was in two places. It was they could. I mean, if you've seen the film, it's about a kind of yeah. it's about an American who comes uh, to uh, uh, to investigate the possibility of a, 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 a Grange Mouth style. Yeah. <laughs> or it like a pipeline. Or yeah, yeah. In, yeah. A, in in this little beautiful piece of coastline. Um, in Scotland. In Scotland, yeah. yeah. But they couldn't find a, a, a suitably quaint village and a suitably beautiful beach next to each other which is how it was in the script yeah so they shot uh at the village it is pennon which is on the east coast of scotland uh and uh the the beach is in Malig, which is on the west coast of scotland yeah. so we shot on the west coast of scotland first of so it was a kind of incredible experience what well, year was this 1981 81 i think 81 82 uh but I'm trying so, to figure out whether I, I, I studied that film. Did you? In film studies. Oh, wow. It was like one of the terms was uh, we wrote an essay on. Like, this is so surreal. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, so it was very. It was yeah, very, and what about me? What did you study? <laughs> Fuck no. <laughs> um, I remember just seeing it and also, I mean, it was a, it's a great film anyway, but I remember being, also being struck by there's a quality about your performance, which is also. I guess, which probably now I would guess was derived from the fact that you hadn't been trained or you hadn't not, been, not a clue. Y yeah, but that that works to your advantage in that film. You, there is a, it's a remarkable performance. You seem so kind of natural, oh, you. and you know. Well, but I remember you, you, know, you didn't obviously didn't know you then. Or I would, I guess I would have just about been in the business, but still not really. You know, I'd only done maybe just about started in telly, but. Oh. You know, it just seemed. Uh, I mean, it's a, it is a. It seemed at the time a fantastic film, and you seemed fantastic in it. Really. Oh, thank you very much. You're um, yeah, well, I didn't have a clue. Again, I didn't have a clue. You know, and really, I was. If you see the film, you can see. If you look carefully, you'll see I've got pierced ear because I really had an earring and all that. I was more used to having like <laughs> electric red hair and stuff like that, and dressed mm. in black and stuff like that. So this. Playing this kind of geeky kind of character wasn't really my. I didn't. Uh, you know, I didn't know how to do this. I was just lucky. Bill was such a good director and just told me not to act. Just kept saying, "Don't right. act, don't act." Uh, but I mean, it was a very, it was a very bizarre experience in, the, in that it came out of left field and suddenly I was lifted out of. You know, I was. I I, I went from uh, eating curries and playing in a band and and drinking too much. You wouldn't be for money. You would be signing on or whatever. For signing, yeah, I'd just yeah. be signing on. Uh, uh, to Which be, was a thing that used to happen then, where the government gave you money if yeah. you were unemployed. Yeah, but I remember the very first day it was snowing, and we were shooting on the beach, and we were shooting with Bart Lancaster. <laughs> so this is a really bizarre kind of thing. I we happened. should point out that knowing you now, that you're also, which I assume you had then, you have, you have an encyclopedic knowledge of film culture. Well, I was, I was very... interested in all this kind of stuff, so that yeah. I, I knew. So I knew who Bart Lancaster. I mean, probably... yeah, but I don't. I mean, sorry to talk about me again. But I don't know. It. I never knew anything about. I was not a cinephile a, or anything. I never knew any. I mean, right. deliberately in a way, never knew anything about anything. Whereas right. you knew everything about everything. Well, of. I didn't know everything, but I was but interested. Lot, I, anyway, I found so. out stuff because I was interested in, in 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 things in film and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Uh, and Bart Lancaster was a a big star was a huge Hollywood star, uh, but of the golden age. Uh, so to find yourself standing on a beach 
with him in the snow in the snow <laughs> acting being terrified to act was wonderful but he was wonderful you know he was great he said kid gotta tell you kid he said, you have, he said your instinct is fabulous can't understand a fucking word you say but your instinct is fabulous <laughs> <laughs> yeah. great so he was great he but was the whole great. thing was you know the whole thing was, an ex- was, was a great experience I can only say that it was like the film itself uh, and, I, and I was very lucky that I met um, Dennis Lawson uh, who sort of took me under his wing uh, and has remained a friend to this day uh, and who understood that I knew nothing and understood that I was hopeless and understood that I had to be carefully, you know, taught little bits and pieces. Mm. Uh, well, it is. I mean, to be dumped, I mean, it's so... Yeah. I mean, you learn quick if you're talented, but, I mean, it is working... I mean, it's particularly then, I suppose even now, it's all like... It's like, the, I mean, filmmaking was, it's such a weird, you know, it's such a weird experience. And people kind of tearing out bits of cardboard and hanging them in front of your face and stuff for the light, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's all that kind of thing. Yeah. But also it was not the world that I came from. Although I was interested in it, it wasn't, um, I was used to bands and, mm. and art school and painting and, 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 you know, I wasn't used to people who'd been at the RSC and people who had a, a, who knew how to do Shakespeare and people who had been in film. I mean, David Putnam, who just had just produced, I mean, Chariots of Fire had just won, you know, however many Oscars it won and stuff like that. And it, they all just seemed, uh, they were sort of terrifying, terrifyingly different uh, and, 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 and successful um, and other. Yeah. Um, but very kind and very very open. But I, the, the thing that strikes me is that if is that if if I'd been smart, or if it happened five years later, I would have just gone to LA or something. But you don't know right. anything. All I did was I went back to Glasgow and bought all my pals drinks and curries. <laughs> 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 that was my re- response to it. Instead of going, oh wait a minute, you know, fate has just given you this. Yeah, it has told you oh, you've been rejected yeah. uh, by drama school, and yeah. you just got a part in a big movie. Yeah, go with this. Yeah, you know, it took me about a year to realize that I should go with it. You know. Yeah. So what happened? Um, I yeah. just said, well, I, I got to um, I got to go and learn how to do this. Did, did you wait until the movie came out? To go and uh, I don't think, it no. for you, or? Uh, I can't remember actually. Uh, I think yeah, the movie was coming out, but it was it. Was, these were different times then, you know. And I can remember, I couldn't get an agent. Mm. Even though you know, you've been in the Hollywood movie, you couldn't get an agent. Yeah. yeah, I was told by one celebrated agent. I'll always remember this. He said, "The phone's not exactly ringing off the hook for young Scottish boys." He said, <laughs> uh, and I thought, "All oh, right, okay, well." What do I do? That's, that's that. Therefore, there's no market for me. So, uh, and I thought, well, if you don't know, yeah, I don't know anything about acting, so I better learn about it. So I tried to get jobs in it. So I write to people in the theatre, try and get. It's so crazy now. Now you go, go and get a proper agent and go yeah. and just go and wipe people's noses in it, you know, and just get on. And but you too, you don't. I don't know anything. I didn't know anything about this world. When did you meet Elaine? Well, not until I was uh, 27, which oh, was about yeah. five years later, which because was after, was, because yeah. after that, what happened then was uh, I, I I came to London and I, I, I mean, I, w- the band broke up because we couldn't really, we weren't getting anywhere and, 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 and I was kind of, I thought, well, I really want to pursue this. And also in the band, I was the one that had to do all the going around record companies and, right. and getting all the rejections and getting mm. and taking making all the you know we didn't have a manager I had to do all of that and I thought this is just too much um, so uh, I came to London and I, I'd written to lots of people to try and get um, uh, jobs in the theatre uh, and tried to get an, eventually got an agent and uh, eventually got a job at the, the Young Vic uh, and, and did about three plays there and Wait, I, so what year would that be? 1982, 1983. So you came to London. Did you knew people by then in London, or it was you not really. Friends? Dennis, right? Dennis was very sweet, so he he he, he looked after me. But no, I didn't really know him. That so was all right. Hmm. Was it all right? Yeah. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> well, it was great. It was wonderful. It was like kind of uh, 
I, I, I was, the first job I got was, it was, you know, it was connected to music. It was a John Paul, George Ringo and Bert and connected to Liverpool. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, which was a Willie Russell play, which yeah. was great. I was miscast, really, as John Lennon. Uh, as better as George Harrison, which who yeah. I played later on. But uh, they couldn't, for, for some reason, they couldn't find a John, someone who would do it. Uh, so I played John Lennon in this, in Young Vic's uh, revival of... Uh, uh, John Paul, George Ringo, Bear. but also you had to be able to play guitar and stuff like that. So that's I think, one of the reasons I was there, and it was yeah. great fun because you got to be in a bit. And also I met um, Stephen Lewis, who was wonderful. Who, 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 who older listeners may remember as Blakey from All the yeah, Buses. Yeah, uh, later in my show. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but who was a delightful man, man yeah. and he was thrilling because he, he was off the telly. Yeah, uh, and also he was. It struck me that he was so much more than what they had told us he was. So much more than what the sitcom had, had yeah. said. Yeah, well, because he was a graduate of the theatre or stuff. Was he, was he, That's yeah. right, and also he'd written a lot of screenplays and yeah. stuff like that. But at that time, if you had... I guess it was a, a thing I recognised. He, he had an accent. Yeah. He had a Cockney accent. So at that mm. time, you weren't going to go to the National Theatre. You weren't right. going to get a job there. The, 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 the only jobs that were open to you were sitcoms where you could play comedy cockneys and stuff like that oh yeah you bet that yeah but I mean yeah, and he was great at that yeah. but he was also he was a, a you know a real student of comedy and drama and a really clever and interesting man Um it's just not going on for ages and ages and ages this it is yeah it's, it's, it's how long have we been going we just hit an time? hour it's fine though I mean there's, there's no there's no I mean I was thinking we might split this into two maybe at some point since we haven't even got to it I think it might want to be interesting to me no, <laughs> I think fucking the fans or your but yeah we've only just started on, on your yeah, acting yeah we haven't yeah <laughs> <laughs> well we should perhaps hurry up then. Well, no, no whatever I, 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 I'm my concern Wow, well, whew, what a, whew. Oh, uh, those two guys, they're great. Yeah. Um, that was uh, part one of uh, Very Christmas Capaldi, part two will be coming over the holidays. Do you want to say bye-bye to all? Bye-bye to all. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye-bye. A million listenings. Bye-bye to all you million people out there listening. Well, it's not a million people. It's I know a, it is. A million much. listens probably spread over Sequentially. about 40,000, 50,000 people. Yeah. Um, but thanks to them. <laughs> <laughs> bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>